accomplished through their Achieve the Dream work. So John, would you join me please? Aloha kakahiaka, good morning. What I want to do at the beginning of this presentation is create a, a context for what you are about to experience and learn about by sharing with you the framework that we are trying to build for our success agenda and particularly for achieving equity for our target population, the Native Hawaiians. I realize that that is a population that many of you, perhaps most of you, do not have on your campus. So I want to start first by giving you a history lesson, a history of Hawaii in less than five minutes. So pay attention. That history goes back 1,000 years before Columbus set sail before Columbus set sail, when a group of Polynesians on a canoe like that one set sail with just the stars and the waves to guide them, a journey of similar distance to Columbus with a much smaller target. But they did find Hawaii, and they went back and they came back. And over the centuries built a society that became a sovereign nation, a sovereign nation whose leaders were welcomed in the courts of London in Washington, D.C. by the emperor of Japan, a sovereign nation who didn't have a written language until 1820. Twenty years later, 40 percent of the population was literate one of the highest literacy rates in the world at that time. How's that for developmental reading success? <laughs> a sovereign nation that entered into trade, world trade, in sandalwood, whaling, and sugar. That global reach, though, had a devastating side effect. Between 1783 when the first Western contact occurred in 1890, it's estimated that 80 to 90 percent of the native population died from introduced diseases. With that loss of population, the business interests turned to importing labor to be able to support particularly the sugar industry. They went to China, Japan, the Philippines, Korea, Puerto Rico, Portugal. Then, to sort of, in 1893, that same business interest, partly out of an American cultural bias against monarchies, but more importantly to protect their business interests with the United States, overthrew the Queen. Five years later, 1898, the United States engaged in a war with Spain that stretched from Cuba to the Philippines, was looking, for a Phil was looking for a Pacific presence, and annexed Hawaii. Over that next century, many of those immigrant populations followed a very traditional American path, captured in the Japanese expression, kodomo no tame ni, for the sake of the children. The parents worked hard, sacrificed, so their kids could go to school and thrive in the new land. But for the Native Hawaiians, this was not a new land. This was their land, was their land. The loss of that land, the loss of population, the loss of social structures, and importantly, of language and cultural tradition, led to a situation that as we entered this century, Native Hawaiians had the highest levels of poverty, the highest 
rates of disease, the highest rates of incarceration, and in our world, the lowest levels of participation, and when they did participate, the lowest levels of success. So as we set about establishing our success agenda, it was extremely important for us that this become an agenda that was an inclusive agenda, that it addressed our host culture and made them a part of that success agenda. But it was not something that we were going to do for the Native Hawaiians, it was something we were going to do with the Native Hawaiians. So with that history, let me share with you what we call the Hawaii Graduation Initiative, which began with the University of Hawaii Strategic Plan, and we are a part of the University of Hawaii, if you're not familiar with that. But what was different this time, and we've always had strategic plans filled with goals and visions and wonderful actions, but what was different this time is for the first time, we set out very concrete, specific outcomes for graduation, 3% per year out to 2015, and for Native Hawaiians, explicit outcomes, 6% increase each year until 2015. The second leg of the stool is this one, achieving the dream. Right at the same time as that plan was being developed, we were becoming part of achieving the dream. Our sponsors, Kamehameha Schools and the Office of Hawaiian Affairs are both dedicated to Hawaii uh, education for the Native Hawaiians. So they kept our focus there, but what Achieving the dream did is it allowed us to bring to the conversation within the university the importance of developmental ed, the importance of looking at this as momentum, and the importance of using transfer, not just graduation, as a success measure. The final leg of the stool is our state P20 initiative, which is housed within the university, so it gives us good access to the P20 agenda. And it brought in our K-12 partners. And just as importantly, that P20 agenda had a public, policy makers, politicians, business leaders. It allowed us to bring the Achieving the Dream and the Native Hawaiian agenda to that broader population. So these three, became the Hawaii Graduation Initiative. Now, that title, I need to give you a little story here. The relatively new president of the UH system was addressing the legislature and looking for sound bites, ways to capture what we were doing in a speech. At the time, President Obama was announcing the American Graduation Initiative, so to use a little local Hawaii slang, we simply cockroached the name, stole, and created the Hawaii Graduation Initiative and added the soundbite of increased graduates by 25% by 2015. That was not new. That was exactly what we had committed to doing back when we started this initiative. So what is the actual levers that we're trying to deal, the framework we're building? Data, data, data. We believe, Carol, we believe. Everything is public, we, pu we put the data out there, good, bad, ugly, beautiful. We don't just put it out there, we talk about it. I'll be back in a couple weeks on every campus in open meetings like this one, talking about the next iteration of how did we do this year against 20 different measures. And we will compare. There had been a sort of cultural tradition, thou shalt not compare campuses across the system. We're all special. Don't compare us, we do compare. And we compare not to find fault, but to find inspiration. Because what we saw, even in a relatively small system, if we looked at the range of things with developmental math and English and reading for all students, for Hawaiian students, every campus had something where they were number one. 
and every campus had something where they were not, where they were last. So we talk and discuss and compare so we can learn just as we come here so we can learn. So we can cockroach good, cockroach good ideas from you is what it is. As good data users, the more we use, the more we want. We're actively involved. In fact, we're underwriting the cost of developing the state's longitudinal data system so we can get better information on the flow of students in from the DOE and out into the workplace. But we also find, as we've been involved with this work, that the more sophisticated we get, the greater our need for sophisticated understanding of our student populations. We have now multiple paths for developmental ed. How in the heck do we advise which students to follow which path? I'll guarantee you it ain't gonna be compass. We need to have a deeper understanding of what works for what populations. So we're engaged in one of Gates funded projects around analytics for that reason. We're also beginning to say, look, we've got this tremendous amount of data, let's use it. We've got tremendous information available to students on graduation, advising, it's all online, and then we put registration over here. So we have another Gates project that brings the two together. So that when the student at 2 a.m. is saying, I'm gonna sign up for that art class, the computer will tell him, hey John, great you're taking that art class, you know it doesn't count toward anything. Or conversely, hey John, there's six art classes out there and you need a humanities, which one do you want? So we need to start using the data that we do have. The second lever was an innovation fund that we created through one and a half million dollars of internal reallocation, not new money. What had happened was the legislature, and I'm sure none of yours have done this, threatened us with a budget cut. And so we went through the exercises of where we would cut it, and then they said, nah, just kidding. So what we did was we said, look, let's, we already went through the psychology of losing that money, so let's don't put it back where it came from, let's put it into an innovation fund. That's now a base part of our budget. It's been fueling the innovation that's been going on. And faculty love to innovate. They love to have access. This gives us the ability to support them. All we do is require that their projects track against those outcomes that we had agreed on. This funding has proven very popular. When the budget cuts did come, and they did, including salary concessions, this money was protected. It didn't disappear. The third lever is relatively new to us. You heard Steve Johnson talk about it in Ohio yesterday. But our legislature is also interested in outcomes-based funding. So when we worked with them, we said, hey, we don't need new measures. We've got measures. We've got targets. Build a system that reinforces what we're doing. The Board of Regents liked it. They made it its number one priority going to the legislature. <coughs> the legislature liked it, but they didn't have any money. But what they did do was restore the money that had been, they had taken away and substituted with our funding. They were able to give that back to us. We made the decision to say, okay, we've got this money back, it's going back to the campuses based on these outcomes. And for community colleges, there are only five. 35% of the money was about graduates, 40% about transfer, but then there were bonuses for Native Hawaiian, STEM, and Pell Grant recipients. And to get all the money, you had to meet all your targets in all the areas, but they do overlap. So if you could find a Native Hawaiian student who was a Pell recipient, graduating in a STEM field who then transferred, you just hit the quinfecta. <laughs> <clears throat> the final, excuse me, the final lever are policies. And we've been systematically going through our policies at the state level, including the most fundamental, 
The Board of Regents for the University of Hawaii system changed the university's mission statement to explicitly include our commitment and responsibility to being the best indigenous serving institution in the country. It is a part of our mission. We look at the individual policies. Used to be you couldn't retake Compass, now you can. When you do, half the students score higher and score better in, the, uh, succeed better in the higher classes, all driven by data. And we changed our evaluation policy for administrators, so it's not just about 360s, it's about did your campus meet its outcomes, and that's a factor, and that determines salaries. We kept going. As most of you, we got hit with another initiative, except we just said it's not another initiative. There is only one initiative, that is the success agenda. But Complete College America gave us another way to talk to our four-year colleagues. And so we got to focus a little bit more on transfer. And so now we have automatic admission for our students. They get a letter saying, which campus would you like to go to? They don't apply. And more importantly, they get treated like continuing students when they do. We've got reverse transfer, so when they go without the degree, it comes back. We give them the degree and we don't charge them for it. And we're starting to work a lot on dual enrollment programs. Um, so that's sort of the framework. Has it made a difference? The red line is the original projected 3%, 6% increases per year. This is the last four years since we joined Achieving the Dream. Native Hawaiian enrollment has doubled. It is now up to 28% of our student population off of a 20% base in the general population. <clears throat> After an appropriate lag, we're starting to see results on the outcomes. So graduations are now, last year jumped by about 30%. We're now above the original 6% per year targets. Transfers are going through the roof. In areas like remedial math, we're improving for everyone. We've closed the gap for Native Hawaiian students. In our pilot projects funded by that innovation, we can get that up to 80, 85%, and we will scale it. This kind of a framework is sort of a necessary but not sufficient condition. It creates opportunities, it removes some barriers, but the bulk of the work, as all of you know, is the faculty, the staff, the students. And in our case, all of them together in that same canoe. And so I am pleased now to present to you Dr. Tapori Tongaro from Hawaii Community College, who will share a little bit about that college's implementation of programs to improve equity for Native Hawaiians on the Big Island. Tangaro. Paka! Paka Paka! Ku Paka! Ku la loko! Ku! Ku Paka! Ku la loko! Paka Paka! Paka! Ku la loko! Ba ba ba!
Greetings to all of you. Aloha. <laughs> Did you all say aloha? <laughs> Thank you. Um, we um, are can't ask permission to, to come, to present, to share our mana, our aloha with you. Our chant is ask permission to allow our dreams to manifest. And our dreams are important to us. They tell us they are the framework of that's how our spirits speak to us through dreams. And when we manifest those dreams, we enter into passion. And the role of passion in, su in success and equity is, uh, you know how successful it is when someone's passion is engaged in the process. How do we use traditional culture to build equity in our, in our community? First of all, it's knowing our place very well. For us, Hawaii is a sacred landscape. It's not just real estate. We don't live there, just live there. We're born there and we'll die there. And our children will be born there and they'll also die there. Hawaii is a sacred landscape. Our sto traditional stories tell us that our heavens intercourse with the earth. Born from that were the, were the islands and the stars. Then our heavens turn to the constellations and intercourse with the stars and born from that were our sacred mountain tops. And born from that were our people. So you see, our landscape is a sacred landscape and products of that landscape is a sacred la are sacred people. How we engage with our environment is very, very important. We have an old saying, you can visit us for three days, but on the fourth, you have to be family. <laughs> and so in the context of the university system, they've been in Hawaii for 100 years. So it's a great time that we indigenize them into our community. Uh, we don't want to be served. We want to work together. And as much as you help us, we need to help you. And for us, that's equity. Our King Kalakaua said that... Um, Kula is the heartbeat of our people. If you know anything of Hula, and if what you know of Hula came through the media, then maybe you should just disregard that. <laughs> um, what you've seen is Hula. Hula is, ha Hula is a dance of dreams. So how appropriate to be here at a dream conference on, on achieving this dream. But Hula allows our dreams to take form. Hula allows our spirits to play in how we live and how we relate to each other. And because we all dream and we all have spirit, that's how we build equity, by, by coming together at that foundation. So when King Kalakaua said the hula is the heartbeat of the people, we had to look at that very, very closely and understand what that meant. And what we did was when we found out that our people weren't coming to college, 
for one, um, it was too foreign for them. Two, those that did go through the college system came back out and they were intolerant of living within their communities. And they used college as a way to escape. And so we were not, we did not know how to support that. We were afraid that we were losing our own population. So what we did, our old people went into the college system and took our traditions into the college system and not because of a political agenda, but for equal success, for equity among all people, but also there are a lot of foreigners coming to Hawaii. Who is going to teach them how to live in a sacred landscape? No other but the Hawaiians. So we began programs that people could identify with. And these programs, these Hawaiian programs, opened the doors for people to reconsider what the, the university system or the college system was about. And um, we began a, a two-year degree in Hula. Very, very popular. Um, it got people through the door. Why? Because they were familiar with it. It was their practice within a new and refreshing context. It brought them closer to being modern. And that's what we all want to do. We want to be, we want to be modern. Uh, but we don't want to give up that identity that keep us rooted to a place. We also realized that our, our children were, um, our people were considering college too late in their life. Intermediate school, high school, it's a little too late when you live um, in Hawaii and it's a little warm. And you reach a particular uh, high school, it's not the time to be talking about college for our people. We have to begin earlier. There's other things that they need to uh, figure out at that time. So what we've considered doing was bringing our children onto the campus, on, into these non-credited programs, but began their schooling on our campus, on college, offering them what? Our hula program. And here we have um, children from our charter schools, our language, our Hawaiian language immersion schools coming to college. And what happens is now they go home and they talk about college when they're in the second, third, fourth, fifth grade. And, and college now becomes something they, s they talk about around the di the, the, their eating, their dining, uh, whenever they're dining together. And so it's not a foreign concept anymore. We bring the children in on not to just dance hula, but to really embody what that is. And we begin to speak to them through the terms of hula about their dreams, about passion, about success, and how to feed equity. If I give you this much, I need to make opportunity for that much to come back. And make it their right, it's their traditional right to request that of the co their community. Um, what we've done to launch this Unuiti, we call this little cohort of young children that's beginning college, um, well, the Emperor and Empress of Japan was coming to Hawaii. And they asked us, can you come and do some hula, some entertainment? And we said, oh, our hula is not entertainment. Our hula is about spirit. It's about dream and it's about passion. So yes, we'll come and we'll bless them. And this is in Kona. The students were there and um, they expected a younger Emperor and Empress. Um, <laughs> And one of my daughter who was in this in the group says, well, one of her friends in Hawaii said, what's that on top of her head? And so somebody said, oh, it, she's wearing a plate. <laughs> and my daughter in Hawaii says, it's not just a plate, it's a sacred plate. It's important that our entire, from the, the young to the season, to consider college. And we, only because our students go back to the communities, and if the communities do not have any experience of college, they, how are they to support the, the, the person in college journeying through? And so what we've done was I've considered, well, we have a cohort for young children. We should bring the seasoned community into it. Lo and behold, when applications and, and people registered for the course, who registered into the course? The people that work at the university and college. The course was filled with our faculty, our staff, our administrators, our uh, coordinators, our non-traditional students, and our traditional students. You look here and it's a quite impressive list of people that came. We realized that our own faculty, the people that we employ, had dreams that were not being manifested through the work that they were doing. And Hula provided them that opportunity to 
reacquaint themselves with that with that dream and they dream that will uh, will keep them in contact with their spirit and once that dream and that spirit comes together then there's passion and when we mix them then the students you see now become the teachers the coordinators the administrators and it's great to flip it that's equity we also need to remember that we are learners and this opportunity provides that. Those that graduate, well, we continue to engage them. They're going on into their uh, four-year degrees, their graduate degrees, they're seeking their doctoral studies, but we've made opportunity for them to come back to Hawaii Community College and continue their, on their, their learning through us because it's hula that keeps them engaged. So when they're in that math class and it's just not making any sense, then they look at math through the eyes of hula, and they're successful. Now, this is what we do through our program, our Hawaiian Lifestyles program at Hawaii Community College. Now, what do we do for the rest of the community? One, our landscape is a sacred landscape, but in this modern world, we sometimes forget that, and we live on top of that. We, we, we buy real estate, and we totally forget that home, that, that mana, what we call the mana that comes through that land. So we take our faculty, our staff, our whole community back to that environment. And yes, that is a volcano. And yes, they're dancing on lava. And yes, it's hot. When we say you're, uh, you're, you embody your environment, we really mean it. And we take them there. We're to remind them that life is quite short. You have to live well and make good decisions. The lava is coming. Don't duplicate that course. Take it once and go on. Move on. Be successful. <laughs> the lava is coming. <laughs> and then because we, our entire campus, our entire landscape is on sacred landscape, we find these sacred la natural features. On the s these are accessible by your with, with your car. They're on the side of the road. People forgot what they mean. And then those that remember what they mean have no way of knowing how to relate them to student success. So we take our communities back to these features right there in their neighborhood, even on rainy days. And we relook at those old stories and we build new leadership models from those old stories. They keep us Hawaiian. They keep the non-Hawaiian Hawaiian. So we're not, as my father-in-law said, we don't care if you're Hawaiian or not. We care that you know how to act as a Hawaiian. And, um, and this is what we're doing. This, these are um, members, uh, professional membership as well as our communities from both the Hawaii Community College and our sister college up the road, the University of Hawaii. And let me tell you, it's not always easy to pull faculty and staff and administrators from a college two-year and a four-year together in the rain to look at sacred spaces and interpreting them for student success. We've established um, a protocol program that involves the entire community. Um, protocols keep us attuned to the land in which we live in. It also teaches us how to engage with each other beyond the exterior of what we look like or what you may perceive us to be. We get to the spirit of it all. There, we're very, very common in that. We take the most sacred stories, the most sacred images, and re in re reinterpret them for academic success. We don't use foreign models. Sometimes they don't make sense to us. Um, and so we have to use our own models, and we have to create them, and we do. And then when we learn of our place and, and the sacredness of it, and we know how to integrate that back into our own lives, through our own spirit, through our own dreamings, and we trigger that passion, then we're prepared to engage with people beyond our horizon. We have to know of ourselves first before we be engage with others. And this is what we call Hawaii Pamamao. We go and we build our, our traditional kinship with the people of the world. America has somehow taught us how to isolate ourselves. Our traditional story says we're not isolated, we're one family. We have a spirit that connects us all. And so in equity, we have to build that equity on the, what makes us common, what makes us alike. And then we can really know how to assess that relationship and assess people's needs and then deliver accordingly, according to that need. Here we are in Samoa, 
and it's great to take our people to Samoa. For many of our island um, children, this is the first time that they leave Hawaii and they begin to integrate with the larger world. Now, we do so much things Hawaiian on campus and there's certain things that our ch we just do it because it's the culture of it. But for the longest time, it was there were only Hawaiians that were doing them. And what we've done was we've built an opportunity to integrate everyone into it, Hawaiian or not. How are you going to help the Hawaiian if you have no clue of what it's like to be a Hawaiian? So we, in we make reason to integrate and we build on people's indigenous connections to do so. Um, we've created a committee on Hawaiian protocols. Uh, you can get credit for actually serving on this committee. Credit that goes through your dossier, that works through your, your tenure. And, and this has become a very, very popular way of servicing your college as well as your community. Here we are, our uh, academic village. And again, our graduates do come back and they continue in this service. <laughs> Here you have Miss Mary Goya, who was, uh, who she's our assessment coordinator. And then you have uh, Joni on the far, on the far, your far right, who is participating in the, in the printing of the traditional wear as a way of matriculating our learners into the system. And there in the middle, you have our learners. What we've also done at Hawaii Community College was we've created a, a, a ritual ground, dedicated a physical space on campus to help us remind ourselves that we are in Hawaii and we need to dedicate a special ground to that reality and there we gather as a community. That's where we help ourselves remember who we are and how to serve. Here are some of the, the, the children that come to our campus. We use salt in our rituals. Salt has an opportunity for purifying. It's worldwide. It's used worldwide as a purifying agent, but also as a, uh, uh, an item, uh, an element for the preservation of a lifestyle. We throw salt to remind us to keep our, life, our, our li lifestyle alive and healthy and bring some savor to it, but also to protect that very delicate, delicate, piece of us that is the spirit that, also that oftentimes is not engaged in the community or in the community college system. Again, the spirit, when activated, gives birth to passion. And we know that in our colleges, sometimes a student will come in thinking they want to go into this discipline or this program, and in their um, experiencing the other general courses, they pull in another direction because there was there an instructor who lived passion. And, it, and passion will trigger passion, will, is a magnet for other passion. And we, that's how we've claimed a lot of other people's students. They know, they sense, and we're very, very intuitive, still very intuitive. A learner will be able to detect an authentic experience from an inauthentic experience and they'll go for the authentic. And that's how we gain our population. So we invite you to consider that. Ensuring the heartbeat, now this is what we do. By itself, it is not sustainable. We had to create an academic village to ensure that this is not just a trend, that this enters into the infrastructure of our system and how, as our chancellor say, this is how we do business. And, and this is what we've created. For us, ohana means family. Education has always been, in Hawaii, traditionally, something that comes through the family. So it's quite difficult for our students to pay tuition, enter into a classroom, and there's a foreigner looking down at us. Our job is to turn them into family. We need to work as family, build down the silos, and build up the family. And that's how we're going to succeed. We've asked 300, uh, we did a survey of uh, 300 co um, community members who came to our college and we asked them, do you think Ho Hawaii Community College is a Hawaiian place of learning? All 300 said yes, indeed. This is what our graduation looks like. You see, we're not trying to replace academics, Western style academics, we, we're giving an opportunity to integrate it into the, the sacredness of who we are. And so here we have mingle the mingling the traditional regalia of academia 
coupled with our kiheis that remind us that we are in Hawaii and our spirits are engaged in this process. Hawaii Papokeao, the university system of Hawaii is actually going through an indigenizing process. They've committed, as, as Dr. John Morton says, to the success of Hawaii. We're indigenizing the system. We have to. The system can no longer be perceived as an outsider. And we have to change how people, we have to transform how people perceive us. And it begins with how we perceive ourselves. Transformation has to be born from transformation. And we have to begin the transformation as individuals if we're planning to transform an institution. Dr. Marcy Greenwood of the university system says this. I'll let you read that. The last, if not the University of Hawaii, then who? For us migrations, we migrate from island to island, from reality to reality, from family to the university, back to the families. All migrations. The person at the front of the canoe just watches that there's no reefs in the way. It's the person in the back of the canoe that drives the dream. We put the hoi uli in the hand, and they're the ones that dip that paddle deep into the ocean and ensure that, um, that the people, that community will arrive at that shore. The dreaming of the navigation paddle, in our tradition, whenever somebody has a dream, the dream belongs to the community. So our mothers and fathers will say, oh, what, what did you dream last night? And what are we gonna do about it today? Dream is not, a, is not a selfish pursuit. It's a community one. It belongs to the community. So the success of our learners is really the success of our communities. We had to, and I don't like to use the word to legitimize, but we had to legitimize our processes in the university system. We just had to. For us, it made all the sense, but for people who wanted to come in and help, sometimes they just didn't know how to do it or do it in a way that was not so patronizing. We want to deal with indigenous, and because we all descend from indigenous, we need to get back to that platform and begin the building there. That keeps us from that baseline of that we're part of the environment, we're not outsiders. And we want our students to come in with their paddle in their hand, not our paddle, their paddle. Do we know their dreams? Do we know our own dreams? Because if we don't know our own dreams as individuals, how are we gonna help someone with theirs? Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> this is my daughter. And um, I have two daughters. And um, my youngest daughter, who's age nine, she says, Dad, my hopo hopo, aleva heleana ya ame, aleva heleana i amelika, aleva helekula i amelika, heleva i Hawaii. She says, Dad, you don't have to worry. I'm not going to go to America to get an education. <laughs> I'm going to stay in Hawaii. <laughs> Auntie, te Auntie teaches the fishing track. I'm going to go into the fishing track. This is my eldest daughter. She says, Dad, o yai, wa nui ko ma ma aloha ya o, heleana vau i amelika, ma leila vau e helekula nui yai. She says, Dad, you need to remember that although I love you very much, I'm going to have to go to America for my education. <laughs> so I want you to, to be prepared for that. <laughs> She's 11. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the drumming we did was to remind us that we're all connected that the first drum we heard was the drum of our mother's heartbeat while we were in her womb. So we celebrate you mothers who gave birth to us. That's when we play the drum, that's what we do. It's not for entertainment. It's to remind us that we come from human bodies. When we blow the poo, the, the shell trumpets, it reminds us that we migrate. And we may be living here now, but when the lava comes, we'll have to find new land. Our children will migrate in the context of the university system. They'll go from college to college if they need to. Will you receive them? My daughter will be at your college one day. So she needs to come to America. 
Will you know her? Her name is Fiahi Kaai O Hello Nauho na Fiahi Lapa Lapa Fiali Ikana Koole. Will you know that she has a spirit? That she comes from the sacred land? Will you know how to engage her spirit? Do you know that she'll be looking for you who are the most passionate? It doesn't matter the discipline. She thinks she wants to go into veterinarian school. But it's the person that will have the, the passion that will, will call her. Will you be able to host her? We promise to do that with your children when they come to Hawaii. Equity means we serve all, and we serve all ac accordingly. We know that we have spirit. Our dreams are very, very important. And when they two come together, there's passion. And passion in academics should not be an option. We want to honor this moment by providing you with the gifts. The gifts for us is a way of committing to this dream. Again, my daughter will be in your, on your campus someday here in America. Please take good care of her. Uli hia kamauna vela ite ahi a tawaiine vela no hia o kulili a i taua a vela no putea i o talua ya 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 ya. Naka, Tunu, Papa Pope. 